I think that um, the market has evolved in such a wonderful way when it comes to community. How many people are wanting to go out on their own and how many resources there are, how normalized it is now. Back when I was doing it, when you start your own company, it's because you can't get a job. And you know now it's sort of the sexy thing to do versus taking a job. And I think that that's just a, a natural mindset of people being more and more comfortable with um, ambiguity and doing things that are more innovative and being okay with failure. Um, that, that failure isn't a bad word, it's actually just part of the process. All right, that music always puts me in a wonderful mood. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Welcome to episode 13 of Venturing in VC. As you know, this is our live show at inside.com where we speak with top venture capitalists about the routines, journeys, and lessons. You've been able to sign up for exciting guests every single Tuesday, and you can continue to do so at inside.com slash VIVC. Also, as you know, this episode will be going live on Thursday morning, bright and early on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. Um, if you're like me, I'm going to be listening to this and re-listening to this many times because I'm confident that today's guest will be sharing a lot of amazing advice. Now, for today's guest, we are privileged to be speaking with Yuri Kim, who is a partner at Forerunner Ventures. Forerunner Ventures is a firm that focuses on understanding the mindset of the modern consumer. This is going to be an episode unlike none other. I'm super excited for it. A little more details on Forerunner. They are based in my hometown, the Bay Area, specifically San Francisco. Um, and they are a team of visionaries and veterans from multiple disciplines. They've supported some amazing brands like Dollar Shave Club, Chime, Him and Hers, Away, and dozens more. Also, really cool announcement that I'm really excited to chat uh, with Yuri about today. During the pandemic, back in July of 2020, they raised a $500 million, let me say that again, $500 million fund, um, having their total assets, AUM, under management, um, bringing that to $1.2 billion. So this conversation is about to be a wild one. I'm super excited to welcome Yuri to the stage. Hello, Yuri. Hey, Landon. Thanks for the intro. Of course. I hope I nailed that one. <laughs> no, nailed it. I've got new updated news on that fund. We actually oh, raised amazing. another fund this year of awesome. $1 no, billion. Dollars. Wow. Yeah, no, we're really excited to just talk about all the amazing accomplishments that you guys have been able to see, you know, as a fund and also uh, kind of your personal advice for not just capital allocators, but also founders, because I understand you have a very interesting uh, journey to getting uh, you to Forerunner Ventures. Awesome. Can't of wait. Course. Yeah. So we can start like at the very, very beginning, you know, back college days. I understand that you graduated from Berkeley, uh, focused on business administration. I want to talk more about the MBA. Um, yeah. Of course, you went to B school um, at Warden um, over there in Pennsylvania. Um, I'm curious of like one daily routine that you developed while you were in business school that you can confidently say you still use today. You know, Landon, that is a fast jump over college and business school, but a lot of years in between. So we can go back at some point if you all want to talk about it. Um, you know, business school, you're just really busy. You know, you've got a lot of socializing to do and people go there thinking they're going to learn, so learn something. But really what you're learning is how to network and how to be with people and how to, you know, create space for yourself. So, you know, I think that prioritizing is something that's really important when you're in any profession, um, but certainly one where... It, there's a lot of FOMO because you have all your friends who are mm -hmm. all interested in different things. Somebody wants to be at a hedge fund. Somebody wants to be in marketing. Someone wants to be in consulting. Someone wants to start a company. And if you don't know what you really are interested in, you could run yourself ragged doing all of these things and not really achieving anything. So I knew I wanted to start a company or be in sort of the venture ecosystem, startup ecosystem. And so I spent all my time doing that. I was the president of the Entrepreneurship Club. I applied for the Venture Initiation Program, which was uh, kind of an on-site accelerator. Um, I applied for the scholarship that, you know, allowed you to work on your own idea for the summer. Mm -hmm. So just focus, focus, focus. Of course. Yeah, that's the magic word. Focus is really, really key. I'm glad that you were able to learn that, you know, at a young age and still have that, um, you know, carrying on. And that's great advice. I'm confident you give to founders uh, within the portfolio. 
uh, today. Um, so yeah, on the subject of focus, obviously, you know, you prioritize time because um, within becoming an entrepreneur, there was a lot of interest in the entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, for you. I understand you started your first company um, in college, and we'll talk about the second one in a moment, but talk to me about the first one a little bit. Yeah, so that's going to date me because that was in the <laughs> um, early 2000s, really the first dot-com bubble. And I was studying business and I had a friend who was an engineer, actually I lived with a bunch of engineers. And um, we all got together and we felt like this momentum around the cell phone, which by that point was really the Nokia, you know, you could change the color of the face of the phone. It was like a little brick, but I loved mine. Uh, we, we had an idea around mobile software, which if you got a te text message, you could um, kind of hyperlink all of the most important words to be able to do the next most logical action. So if I said, mm -hmm. hey, Landon, you know, meet me at the cafe, cafe could be hyperlinked, Landon could be hyperlinked, and I could call you, or I could map the cafe, or I could make a reservation. Obviously, that was way before the iPhone. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, you can see where that went. The idea was very similar. Um, so I spent basically my entire junior year working on this company off, off campus, uh, you know, in an office, we had an office, we had seven engineers, we were, wow. you know, it was director of operations, whatever that means. That means anything that was not engineering, I yeah. did. <laughs> and, um, it was a blast, you know, and I think that we, uh, we were very early and, you know, subsequent to that, we actually, everybody else had quit school uh, and they were doing it full time. And I was the only one that was sort of bridging both uh, school and work. But, um, you know, the, the bubble ultimately burst um, right around 20, you know, 2001. And I had an internship at Bain that I took for that summer. And then I ended up going back to Bain, um, which, you know, was an incredible experience as well. So, you know, I think we, you talk a lot about um, failure or just like trying different things in your other podcasts. And I think that's something that is true over and over again, whether you're a venture capitalist or a startup founder, um, that you have to you have to have more at bats. You can't just always think that like the first thing you start is going to be the winner. Sometimes it is. But mm -hmm. um, that was a, an early, early indication that I really loved doing new things that, um, you know, I always wanted to have my hands in a lot of different different stuff. Of, of course. Yeah. And you just gave wonderful advice to, um, you know, having conviction as a founder because that journey is never going to be easy. But also I want to allude to something else that you mentioned um, there. Uh, you just said that, you know, you kind of lived and tried to spend a lot of time with uh, different engineers and, uh, you know, people from other backgrounds studying different things while in college. I think that's another really important thing. Um, totally. If you have a specific focus to surround yourself with other people so you can continue to learn about, you know, what they're building and then, you know, find opportunities to collaborate. So I think that's another wonderful skill. Um, that Absolutely. was developed early in your career. Um, so now I'd love to speak a little bit about Maven. Um, this was the second company um, that you had developed while at Wharton. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> no, no, we got to do the diligence, of course. Um, but yeah, these were luxury work bags, um, accessory company for women. I understand that this kind of um, started and sparked your interest in consumer product. But let's let's break it down. You know, how yeah. did you come up with this idea? Um, and you know, what was it like building a company? <laughs> so that, that actually predates. So, um, my first, my first job out of college was Bain. I was a consultant and associate consultant, uh, in a San Francisco office. Of course you're starting work, you're getting dressed up, you're going to the office. And I just would notice that the women had really nice handbags and then mm -hmm. like the, it was the free Targus black laptop bag. I don't know if you've even seen one of those, but it was really ghetto. And it just was on your desk, you know, when you started work and people just used it. It was hideous. And I thought, well, this is, this is awful. There's got to be a better way to do this. Like here are these fancy, you know, bags that we have um, that don't fit anything. And then here's all this other jazz we have to carry. So maybe there's a way to do that together. Um, logged it in the back of my mind. I still wanted to, uh, you know, continue my, my journey as a first and second year consultant. I finished my associate consultant program. Um, and I continued to have this like balance of really loving investing uh, because as an associate consultant at Bain, I was also staffed to teams that were uh, supporting private equity firms, um, supporting retailers and consumer products businesses. So early exposure um, mm -hmm. to those industries was really what laid the foundation. But I had this startup idea in the back of my head, always to do it, uh, but didn't feel like now is the right time. And um, ultimately, I ended up starting it while I was in business school. 
I explicitly thought, you know what, I'm going to learn my skills at Bain. I then, you know, uh, I can gloss over it now, but we can go back to it if you want to later. But I went into private equity investing for two years after Bain. I then started um, working at a startup company in London and all the while felt like I still needed to learn different skills. I wasn't ready to start my own company. Um, but once I got to business school, I thought, okay, I don't have any more boxes to check. I feel like I've earned the right to go and do something myself. And so I spent all of my time on my business plan and, you know, finding designers and finding factories. And I spent my summer between those two years at business school doing my own company. Um, and it was a blast. So really leveraging that time. I think, um, you know, my generation, especially a lot of times we want to rush it, you know, we yeah. want what tomorrow has to come before, you know, uh, yeah. it's there, you know, we want to build this unicorn, we want this, but I love that you kind of took a step back uh, before taking the two steps forward and kind of said, okay, these are the skills that I need to uh, redefine. These are the skills that I want to obtain, um, you know, while focus on private equity, while at Bain, before launching a company. Um, So we can kind of pivot a little bit before we dive dive a little deeper into Maven about some of those specific skills um, that you were able to obtain, you know, while at Bain, uh, maybe some that you still even continue to use today. Oh, man, so many, so many. Um, You know, at Bain, you learn really early on about this concept called answer first. Anyone who's a consultant needs to get there because you need to understand how do you get to a decision? And what's your hypothesis? Because if you have a problem you're trying to solve and you just start trying to solve it, there's no direction and you could end up what they call boiling the ocean. You just keep on going into perpetuity on analysis, analysis, analysis. And 10 hours later, you wake up and you're like, did I do anything? What what have I done? I'm, I'm exhausted and I don't have an answer. And so it was this idea of always putting a hypothesis out there and saying, what are the tests that I need to do to prove or disprove that hypothesis? And I use that every single day. That's actually the most helpful thing in venture is to be able to say, well, what do you have to believe to make this company work or not work, you know, to make this idea uh, a potential winner or, you know, kind of a dud? And, um, And I learned that at Bain. There's also kind of the 80 20 where, you know, you could aim for perfection, which many of us do. But the last bit of it takes so much time and it doesn't move the needle on, again, back to the answer. What's the decision? And so the faster you can get to really 80% of the answer and 20% of the work means that you can um, prioritize your time, be more efficient, be more effective. And it's not to say that you don't, you know, you're never going to have things be all the way to sort of a complete level, but just you have a direction. You kind of know, should I be going left or right? And um, I use those every day. Uh, And then in in private equity, you learn the nuances of what makes a company uh, run. You know, what are every single line items Mm -hmm. on the P&L? What are the things like working capital that if you grow, you need more cash? And if you hadn't gone to a finance class and learned that, you'd end up with, oh, my gosh, I don't know what's going on. I'm selling all these things, but why am I out of money? Well, it's because you need to spend the money to make the product to sell. So if the stuff is selling, you need to put more money in before you get paid for it. And these are all concepts that you learn in accounting class and you learn in maybe, you know, intro to finance at school. But when you actually like really look at company after company after company and understand their profit and loss statements and their balance sheet and their cash flow statement and you understand how they all connect, um, it helps you as a founder, be able to navigate, well, how much money do I need? Do I need to raise a million dollars or can I do this on a hundred thousand? Um, and if I, if I need more money, then what kind of growth do I need to project forward to be able to, uh, continue to capitalize that company? So all of those things I I feel were integral learnings that I had in in having quote a real job, you know, you can learn on the fly starting your own company, but it really is hard to learn everything by yourself. I think that was one of the biggest lessons being a founder of my own, you know, Maven, uh, that there was nobody else around. I mean, I worked with people, different vendors, different contractors, but I didn't have a team at that time. And it was very lonely. Um, And, you know, I might, I might want to think that I'm smart and everything, but it really helps to have a thought partner, some folks around the table to add value in different ways and share expertise. Um, So that was a bit long winded to your question there, but I do think this the tangible skills of how do you think strategically, how do you prioritize and, and figure out how to, um, what do they call it, like separate the signal from the noise? Yep. There's a lot of noise all over the place. Of course. you got to stay really 
focused, <laughs> you know, the, the F word. <laughs> yeah. That's a very important word. And I just, you know, I love the points, the three points that you just gave, you know, really paying close attention to the numbers, uh, you know, looking at the 80-20 rule as well that you developed. Um, and also the first one, you know, like, um, you know, finding the answer first. I, I see clear I theme it. between all three of those. Um, it's really, you know, reminiscent of what you did early in your career as well. Sometimes you got to take that step backwards before you take the two steps forward. Um, so I think that the, that's just a really, really great, um, you know, <laughs> list of skills and uh, points that you were able to give um, in your, from your early career. And now we can now talk about, uh, Maven again, you know, because you were able to take all those skills, um, really learned a lot about strategy, uh, learned a lot about building and a lot of about focus and patience. You were able to take all those skills into building Maven. Um, we'll start with my first question, you know, surrounding Maven. Um, you know, what was it like developing a consumer product back then? Because I know you obviously focus a lot. On, a long time uh, ago, uh, too. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm curious. So, like, how, how has it changed? How has the ecosystem um, kind of shifted um, over the past few years? Well, I mean, it is truly, it was a long time ago. I think that was in 2007 to 2009. Mm -hmm. So, um, Guild Group had just launched. Wow. Bonobos was launched the year before me at Stanford by Andy Dunn, yep, I met also him. Bainey, yeah. right? Yeah. And Warby Parker was launched a year after me by the Warby Parker team, who was at um, Wharton one year uh, behind me. So it was the beginnings of direct-to-consumer brands, mm -hmm. the, the modern version of them. And I remember I needed to hire someone to build a website. There was no, <laughs> you know... No code. Yeah, you know, there was no code, <laughs> low code, whatever. There was no any of it. You know, we we literally had to build page by page. And so there's the business of making a handbag and how was I going to pick the leather and the design and the hardware and find a manufacturer and go through prototype one, two, three, figure out how to pay for all those things. Um, then there was the business of building a brand, which, you know, I, I wanted it to be um, – a, a smart luxury brand, something that stood for being high end and quality, um, but also extremely functional and the, the narrative that goes into that. Um, and then the business of just like, how do you sell online? And I, I was very dedicated of, uh, to selling through e-commerce versus going through retail. Mm -hmm. um, that was just the beginnings of that being a channel that you could consider as a new company, but it was all very manual and very difficult and I think, um, actually, somebody said, you know, it's a lot more expensive. <laughs> I never realized. But when you ask yourself, like, why is this purse so expensive? It's because every detail on that is very difficult to actually manufacture. So this experience gave me so much appreciation for how hard it is to make a sweater, you know, or to make these earrings. Like, it's not just, you know, snap your finger and it gets done. And so... When I, when I kind of set out there, I was like, I wanted pockets here. I wanted a slap here. I want, you know, a folding area there. Every single thing costs more money. And I thought, okay, well, no one's going to buy this thing because it's going to cost, you know, $10,000 to have this bag. So either I can take stuff out and make it more simple. Um, I can use lower quality products or I can charge more or I can take less margin. There's only a few ways that you can change the equation. Um, and so those are all things that, you know, as you're building this company, there's so many parts of the company that you as a founder have to think through. And I think that's why the type of people who are drawn to starting their own thing are very much like Jack of all trades or Jill of all trades. They love, they have a, a lot of ideas. They can do a lot of things pretty well, but they're not going to be an expert at any one thing. And that's how I was. I wasn't an expert designer. I was not an expert leather, you know, manufacturer. I am certainly not even a novice leather manufacturer. But the coordination of all of those things was something that I was, you know, I think good at. Um, but, but it was extremely early. And I think now starting a brand um, or starting a product-based business is somewhat more navigated. You know, the, the path is more um, tested. But, you know, it doesn't take away from all the different things you have to think about. No, it's clear that you learned a lot during these years. And um, Yuri, I smiled when you said uh, Jack of all trades because it's almost like you're reading my mind. Um, I have a question related to that as well. Yeah, okay. Um, I understand that you gave a talk um, a few years ago at Stanford um, mm -hmm. where you made the statement that early stage startups need generalists. So um, my question for you is, you know, when do you think um, it is appropriate? Um, at what stage for a company 
um, for you know companies to start recruiting masters of one um, if there is one you know is it Ooh, after yeah is it after product market fit etc if we can dive into that that'd be that'd be helpful you know, it, it really depends on what kind of company you're building. But what I would say is in those early days, you need every person who's on the team to be doing five jobs Yep. because you can't afford anything else. Yep. <laughs> and, you know, if you have a, a, a team of co-founders, that's obviously great because usually you've got a business co-founder, you've got a technical co-founder, maybe you have a more creative or marketing oriented co-founder. So you kind of have the three headed monster that you need. Um, but over time, what's very challenging is that each leader needs to bring in people that can actually go deep. And so what ends up happening is you have a generalist leader in some functional area, call it CTO, um, that then needs to hire individual contributors. And those people are, I do work. I know how to literally code and that is what I do. I don't need an engineering manager. I don't need a head of eng- you know, a head of product. That, yeah, I don't need any of that stuff. I just need sort of senior person who's got very generalist approach, and then I need people who can do the work. Then you get something up and running, maybe V1 of the product, and it starts to be able to be tested in market. Um, Then you need more people who can do the work. But pretty soon, you get to a point where this generalist leader does not actually know how to build out Mm -hmm. the deep uh, technical team that you would need to scale the product. On, you know, a more physical product side, you might have... um, you know, me doing like all of the, you know, design and, and um, picking the leathers. But is that something that I should be doing? Or at some point, should I be hiring somebody whose job literally it is to design the collection? Um, I might be able to give ideas, but like someone else should be drawing it. I was literally drawing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so when you think about staging, you were saying loosely, is it after product market fit that you need to hire some specialists? It's probably a good place to start. Um, I would say you hire the junior specialist before product market fit because you need somebody to, you know, again, go in and do the work. Um, and then after product market fit, you have more direction as to where the product needs to go. And then you have more sense of, okay, well, then how do I build that team? And so who would be a sort of head of level or director level leader who can help build out that early team? Really appreciate that breakdown. I know our audience is really going to love that as well. Um, you know, it really reminds me of a book that I read a few months ago, Working Backwards, where it really yeah. focuses on single threaded leadership. Um, wow, that is a common theme of our interview. I mean, really just like before you build for the future, you got to really, you know, work backwards. I think that you that's really a really do. powerful. You got to know where you're going, breakdown. right? Yep. You can't just start running like, yep, in what direction, exactly. you know? I love that. I love that. Um, so, uh, Yuri, another question for you just about this time, you know, before we uh, kind of transition into Forerunner. Um, I understand that, you know, you're a founding member of All Rays, you know, the female mentorship collective, um, which has done remarkable work and had such a great impact. But I mean, you know, when you were starting your company, I imagine that there weren't as many resources for women entrepreneurs as there are today. Um, so if we can think back. I'm curious, what resources did you either depend on um, or utilize, you know, back when you were founding a company and you were looking for advice. Um, And also how important was community back then? Um, I understand a lot of emphasis on community. We see how important it is, um, but, you know, let's kind of bring it back and just see um, if there were any communities back then. Uh, It's such a great question, Landon. I think that um, the market has evolved in such a wonderful way when it comes to community, how many people are wanting to go out on their own and how many resources there are, how normalized it is now. Back when I was doing it, when you start your own company, it's because you can't get a job. And, you know, now it's sort of the sexy thing to do versus taking a job. And I think that that's just a, a natural mindset of people being more and more comfortable with Um, ambiguity and doing things that are more innovative and being okay with failure. Um, That that failure isn't a bad word. It's actually just part of the process. And so for me back then, I was definitely a lone wolf. There were not a lot of people who were wanting to start their own companies, but I found community at business school because we still had a small band of thieves over there who were really interested in entrepreneurship. There was no venture, guys. Like There was nothing about, I want to be a venture capitalist because that was still a black box and I had no idea how you could possibly get into that. I did not think that I could be a venture capitalist. So I was very much, I want to start my own company. I did not necessarily need venture capital funding. I was feeling pretty strong that I could um, fund it myself. I was bootstrapping it. I had two jobs. Like there were a lot of different ways that the OG founders, you, you know, yep. do. You just <laughs> bootstrap it. And I think that um, you, 
you lean on small business loans, you lean on um, government grants. I was just scouring for any scholarship that I could find, and it was in $10,000 increments. You know, my first $10,000 came from this venture initiation program where I was paid to be able to go do my own startup, and I lived on that. I, you know, I made it work, and um, and I took a lot of pride in that, you know, and I think a lot of founders work their bums off saving and scrimping and, you know, juggling two jobs or whatever to try to pay for their ideas. And I think that's, it's a lost art because now everyone says, I want to start a company. I need to raise $5 million. You don't, you know, you you don't, you, you really need to think about why you want to start this company Mm -hmm. and what does that actually mean? Because starting a company is more transactional and tactical, but like what business is it that, that you're inspired to build and market? Like what, what's the problem you're solving? Um, you know, and I, I look now at all the resources there are on like, how do you start? Like, I remember trying to, you know, develop the LLC for my company and deciding whether it was a C corp or an S corp or an LLC. And that was just like online searches. I think now it's so tried and true. You could just search LLC and it's, everything is right there. You click a button, boom, you've got your LLC. Um, so it's goods and bads. You know, I think that there's a lot of services now that make it much more, um, much less lonely because there's more people doing it. Um, but at the same time, the journey is still very, uh, for each person, the journey is individual. Mm -hmm. And just because you are able to talk to other founders about it doesn't change like how hard it is for you to get through that founder journey yourself. That is true. I mean, not only are we talking about focus and direction today, but also conviction is just super important. I oh, love right. all the advice that you're sharing because it's so authentic because you've lived it. I mean, you've <laughs> seen this. Um, so I know the founders really appreciate working with you because um, you, again, have that experience, you know, founding yourself. Um, so we can now transition into Forerunner. Um, it is, to my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but to my understanding, you were interested in starting a third company, but then you met Kirsten Green, um, who thought, you know, you'd be perfect to um, help build something special with her. Um, if that is true, I'm curious how you originally met You do met some Kirsten. good digging. I, like I, I have to. This is venturing in VC. We have to. <laughs> um, you know, what What it was is, um, and I, if you had a chance to listen to that Stanford talk, uh, the reason I didn't continue with Maven is because my father passed away. And it was a, um, it was a very sudden uh, event that we didn't expect. And so here I was, just graduated from business school in June. He attended my graduation. And in July of 2009, he passed away. So I was planning to move to New York, starting my company in earnest. And I rerouted everything to move back to the Bay Area and take care of my mom, who was back here um, running a small cafe. And uh, it was a family business. And when you, when you are a founder, that is all you think about just morning, noon, and night. That's all you do. And when you have other things in your world that start to, you know, you can call it a distraction, you can call it priority, you can call it a crisis, whatever you want, but there's other things that are demanding your time. It is very difficult to then continue to have the founder mentality, the grit and the focus that we keep talking about to be able to push things forward. Um, And so I still launched that business. Um, I remember distinctly making the the e-com site go live while I was sitting in a cafe chair at my mom's. It was a tiny little cafe. And I think there were like two small tables inside. And, you know, there I was. Like I had my site live. Of course, nobody was on it because who would be on it? Who was buying anything? You know, back then it was so early and there was... Actually, there was no Instagram, guys. It was really <laughs> a long time ago. Different time. <laughs> you know, I think I did the Facebook post. Um, but it was um, it, it was not something that I had the mental mindset to do. And after I took about six months off to um, take care of my mom and kind of figure out what, what that was going to entail to digest the fact that I wasn't actually going to start this company, really, Uh, which was sad, you know, because I'd spent a lot of time waiting for this moment and it just Mm -hmm. wasn't available to me at that time. And um, and thinking about what next. And so I ended up calling my old team at at Bain and and thinking I I have wonderful memories of working at Bain here in San Francisco. Maybe they need somebody. And turns out they did. And they, you know, I think I started a month later. And um, 
and then my mom got cancer. I mean, a lot of stuff happens in life, you know? And so there were just so many personal things that were really uh, so much more important to me at that time. And, you know, Bain was incredible just to be able to work for a larger team, a larger infrastructure, um, doing a job that I love and I'm quite good at, you know, it was not taking so much mental bandwidth and I could spend time with my family and take care of my mom um, and still obviously pay my bills and pay for my school loans and all the things that are just really fundamentally like a part of life. You can't, you know, just because you want to start a company doesn't mean someone else pays for your bills. <laughs> you do. Um, but when I finished my two years um, post business school at Bain, you know, there's a natural moment where you say, okay, am I going to stay here and do partner track or am I going to go do something new? And I realized I had taken quite a hiatus off of the sort of startup mentality and focus that I had had for so many years. And I did want to start another company, but I didn't have an idea and I didn't have a team. And I decided that what was really kind of not fun about my first time starting a company, or I guess Maven, second time, but uh, first time starting my own idea, was that I didn't want to do it alone. I wanted to have co-founders or I wanted to have a founding team. And since I didn't have a team and I didn't have an idea, that doesn't set you up for that much success. (laughs) But I thought, I'll just, I'll start, I'll get back out there. I'll start meeting people. I'll start learning about, you know, what companies there are. And if I can find a company that is doing something fabulous, Mm -hmm. I'll join. Um, I also looked into venture capital because at that time there were a couple of firms that were doing it in a more consumer way. Mavron was out there, um, one of our, our friend firms in the, in the ecosystem, but it was really just a couple of people. And so I called those people and got meetings and they told me there's no way you're going to get a job in venture. But one of the, um, principals at Mavron actually, who took the time to have a coffee with me was in the process of starting his own company. And I didn't know that at the time. I was, you know, thinking I was interviewing, maybe, you know, air quotes, interviewing for potentially a job there. And um, and at the end of it, he's like, you know, there was so much connection. He's like, I'm actually leaving. I, I'm i going to start my own thing. Would you want to join me? And I thought, wait a minute, what? <laughs> I'm like, you're leaving? I mean, there's so many things happening real time. <laughs> and he had um, a company that he was working on. And I actually got really far along with him in that journey. And at the end of it realized, you know, this is so early that if I do this again, I think I would still want to do my own. Um, so I didn't take that job. Um, and I ended up staying at Bain for another couple months. And then I met Kirsten. And at the time, Kirsten Green, the founder of Forerunner, she, um, she was angel investing. And she was sitting on the board of a company called Serena and Lily, which is one of our first, you know, foreigner investments. But my uh, friend from business school, Mitchell Green, was also on the board. And he connected us and just said, you know, you're two women investing in consumer businesses. Seems like you'd get along. You should have coffee. And so we both said, okay. And we, we met up for coffee down at the ferry building here in San Francisco. And within about five minutes, I was like, this, this lady is my peeps. Like this, wow. this person's got a lot of the heart and passion and conviction and consumer mindset that I felt deeply about. And here she was investing in a lot of these businesses that either I knew the founders because they were my friends or I had come up with the same idea. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that, that company exists. Great. Because I just thought about that two weeks ago. And so there was so much overlap that I just logged in my head this is incredible. Here's this amazing woman out here making angel investments in a way that I didn't think was possible. There was no job, guys. There was no foreign ventures yet. It was just her investing. And um, then I said, you know, let me know if I could ever be helpful. And we parted ways. It was a, you know, probably a two-hour coffee, which went an hour and a half too long. And that was in December of 2011. And then by January of 2012, she had her term sheet for her first um, – investor in our, our first institutional fund. And she called me and we met met for breakfast at Jane in San Francisco in, um, in the marina. And she offered me a job. And I had no idea what that even meant at the time because, you know, I, I didn't know I could have a job in venture capital. I didn't know what foreign was. It wasn't, it wasn't actually a firm yet because we, we didn't, I joined her before we had um, completely raised that first fund. I was sort of in the, in the memo or the offering memorandum is what you call it, a um, private placement memorandum. 
Um, and so that, so I took that bet. I said, okay, well, this is a startup because here's a founder. She has a great idea, yep. a conviction, and I'm into it. Like, I don't know what's happening here, but I'm into it and I will take the risk for this. So I quit my job at Bain. Uh, I'm still very close to the whole team there. And I remember uh, the senior partner who ran the San Francisco office was also a personal mentor. And he kind of flipped, he, he said, Gary, what are you doing? You're leaving us again? You're, how many times are you going to do this? And I was like, I'm Last sorry. Time. If this doesn't work <laughs> out, I promise I will stay. I will come back and stay. He's like, okay, deal. I will let oh. you go. But if this doesn't work out, you come back. And uh, and so I did. I, I left in... Um, early 20, uh, 2012, and then I started here at Forerunner in May of 2012, and it's been t- almost 10 years. Wow. Yuri, that was such a beautiful story. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you so much for getting uh, so personal you know, about your family on our show. Um, I can clearly see how much empathy and compassion uh, plays a role in your life um, and know that the founders that you work with every day are really lucky to work with you um, because not only, again, have you seen it all, but like you really uh, – can uh, see things from that mindset, um, you know, just you, uh, especially man. during these challenging times dealing with uncertainty. Um, second of all, screw anybody that said that you wouldn't be able to be successful, have a career in venture. I mean, they'd probably be <laughs> laughing to see what you're doing today now. But um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'd say my um, my third question, I mean, you just said it yourself. I mean, you know, and I'll, I mean, it's obvious to say that Forerunner now did not look like Forerunner like it did yeah. when you started, um, you know, over 10 years ago. You equate it to, you know, working for a startup because it was a startup. Um, so we'll kind of just ask the straight out question. Um, you know, what is your advice for maybe some VCs interested in creating their own funds today? Um, I know it looks different now than it did when Forerunner was starting, but were there any, you know, kind of insights that really made the journey a little less complicated and advice that you'd want to share with um, interested capital allocators? Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll say straight up, this is a long term job. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time to build anything of of substance, of quality, but venture capital is investing in startups that haven't started yet especially if you're early stage, if you want to do growth stage, obviously it's not as relevant, but when you're so, so early, it takes so long for your winners to win. And what you find is that the winners take long, longer. So you get their early losers and that's fine because they just flame out. You've got the long-term winners, which you hope continue to move forward longer and longer because that means they're continuing to scale. They're not getting bought out early. And then you have everything in the middle, which is somewhat amorphous. You don't know if they're going to win. You don't know if they're going to lose. They kind of just hang out. And you want the flame outs to be fast because then you don't have to worry about it and you don't spend more money on it and you want the winners to take long. So either way, you just see that this whole timeline is extending longer and longer. Then what you have is whenever you win something over here, you hope that that pays back the whole fund, but it may not. And then you have to wait for the next winner and the next winner. And so the way that venture capital math works is that for you to really make money, you need to be returning in excess of two or three times your fund such that you can start to get into what you all know as carry. Mm -hmm. And you will raise fund after fund after fund before you really have that winner. Because if the winner takes 10 years and each fund is raised within two years, then you have five funds before you have the first winner. And I don't think anyone really gets that. You don't just raise one fund and win. You have to have multiple funds, right? You, you'll run out of money after 18 months if you have just one fund. And then what are you going to do? That's it? That's it? You get a new job? So when you think about starting your own fund, think about starting your own firm. We were always starting a firm. We were two people. We hired Nicole as our analyst the next year. And always treated everything that we did as though it was a 25-person firm. We did Mm -hmm. investment memos. We had a deal list. We had deal meetings. I mean, it was me and Kirsten. Like, we we didn't need to be so formal. (laughs) But we processed everything with formality because we said, look, we may be new. We may be young. But we're not going to stay small forever. We always set an intention to build a firm that was going to last and hopefully outlast us. But outlasting us means outlasting 25 years because this 
job just takes a long time to get good at. And it takes a long time, especially for those who are um, high achieving. You kind of want to know, am I good? Am I good? Did I make money? You are not going to get that here. You don't know if you're good for a long time. And once you find out that you're good, it only says that your winner only says that you were good 10 years ago. <laughs> but are you still good now? You know, it's a bit like the, the star athlete that's like, yeah, I'm winning. But like, am I going to win next year? Am I still relevant? Can I? Do I still have the touch? And so this has to be um, really internally motivated. And you have to have that confidence and conviction and ability. If, if your ideas are like always so popular in market, then it's not a good idea. It's played out. It's over, right? You need to have the contrarian viewpoint to be able to suss out if there's a really interesting sort of rock that you're turning over that somebody else didn't see. And everyone can always look back and look at your track record and say, oh, wow, you were so smart to invest in, you know, XYZ company. But at the time, it didn't look like that. It didn't look like a winner. It just looked like every other company. And um, so, you know, the advice I would offer to the young capital allocators is go and work somewhere and learn learn because there's so many mistakes that you don't have to make because if you're just in the room listening to more experienced investors, founders, just being in the room, it's it's learning that you know, it's really apprenticeship model. We we do that here. I train our team and our um our junior investors the same way where I can't teach you how to do a deal, right? You just need to be in the room. You need to listen to these meetings, you need to ask the questions, you need to memorize what it looks and feels like to talk to an exceptional founder because you won't know until you kind of tie all the dots together. Um, so I do feel like there's a lot of benefit from taking some time and working with other investors before you go off and do your own thing. Obviously, there are some that are still going to do their own thing. And to, to those folks, I would just say, keep a long-term mindset. This is not a 10-year journey. It's a 25-year journey. And if that sounds like way too long for you, don't and you shouldn't be in this business. <laughs> don't do it. You know, yeah. there's a lot of other ways to make money. Yep. Holy cluster. Yeah. No. Love the points that you're giving. I mean, just really, really wonderful advice on long-term thinking, surrounding yourself with, uh, you know, people who you want to be like or you know aspire to be like. You know, before maybe committing yourself to an industry, um, as such as VC. I think, um, you know, just looking at the overall tech landscape, I mean, looking at a business and everything that's going on, you know, it's a very exciting time. But I mean, it seems that every, it seems that every, you know, there's a new trending thing that everybody wants to get their hands on. Um, so to your point, what might be hot today, it might not be hot um, in 10 or 25 years. And that's something that you kind of have to consider. Um, so I think that you're giving some really, really, really wonderful advice there. Um, I would love to dive in now to, you know, the type of um, investments that you guys are making, you know, sectors that you're really interested in, and even uh, average check size in case there are any founders that are interested in pitching Forerunner um, today, tomorrow, anytime in the future. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you teed it up perfectly in the intro where we're really always focused on evolving consumer behavior and consumer mm -hmm. need. And I wrote a piece last year just coming out of the pandemic, which was all about, you know, people talk about product market fit. And I, I coined this term sort of product human need fit, because when you go through something like COVID, nothing really matters other than the most important things, your family, your health, you know, your, your job, how are you going to pay for things? How are you going to take care of your family? And I think what COVID also um, highlighted is the disparity of who has access to basic services and who doesn't, who's much more on the line of not making it and any any given um, bump in the road could send them off in the wrong direction in terms of not having that paycheck or not being able to figure out where they're going to live or how they're going to you know um, educate their children and so you know when we all think about human needs and consumer needs it's that problem point of there's a lot of problems to solve in this world, but there are some that I think are more important to solve and more impactful to solve than others. And that's how we think about our themes. And so we, you know, we're very focused on the empowerment economy because mm -hmm. there's so many people out there that want to like work for themselves. And it's sort of the next generation of small to medium sized businesses. And maybe that's creator, like hashtag creator, or maybe it's influencer or whatever you want to call it. But we, we think about it more as how do you enable more people to have financial freedom because they can work for themselves? And what are all the tools and technologies and platforms that are needed to be able to do that? So we've invested in a few of those. There's, you know, one called Medify that's in the gaming space. Gaming's so hot. But how do you learn how to game? 
Like, what, what if you wanted to learn how to be a better Roblox player? There's nowhere to do that. On Medify, you can actually get a coach. You can get a teacher. Hmm. You can get some training such that maybe that's something you want to do for fun or maybe you want to be pro. Who knows? But these are all things that were never available before. And Medify is thinking about how do you empower that ecosystem with bringing knowledge together with, you know, demand and learners. Um, there's something called Fora, which is really new, but it's in the travel space, but it's reimagining almost like the travel agent and how many of us have done these great trips and we plan everything copiously. And there's always one person in every group of friends that I feel like is like the, the travel agent. Like they're the ones that are like, you know, they know which hotel to book. They know how to like use the points. They know how to get the activities what if that person could actually give that itinerary to somebody else and get paid for it? You know, so there's other ways for you to do what you love, but actually like make some money for, from it. Um, health, as I mentioned, huge human need. We actually just announced yesterday a tele, uh, um, an investment in a telemedicine platform called Amplify MD. It's a, oh. a bit, it's a click away from consumer consumer because it's actually selling into hospitals. But the idea came out of this vision of, you know, healthcare should be accessible to all. But 50% of hospitals in the U.S. don't have access to specialists they need. This is like cardiology. Like my dad had a heart attack. No cardiologist in the hospital means nobody to serve your, your you know, friend or family member who has a heart attack. Um, and so Amplify MD is a telemedicine platform that brings specialists together onto the platform that hospitals can um, basically tap into. And it enables them to service their patient population in the hospital instead of transferring them out. So, you know, really... a um, aspirational. I mean, everybody should have access to great health care. Um, you know, there's a lot of ideas around better for you. So that's not only sustainability, but it's literally better for us, you know, nutritionally, better for us mentally, better for us um, in terms of, you know, getting access to all the innovation that's in the market from different products and services. We invested in a company called Eclipse, which is a plant-based dairy um, business. It's a platform. They have Incredible ice cream. So if you're lactose intolerant or um, just vegan, you uh, can find Eclipse at Whole Foods in NorCal, and we're starting to expand more more nationally. But it's delicious. It's creamy. It tastes like ice cream. It's just like amazing, and it's all plant, no GMO. Wow. Everything's like a real actual ingredient that you don't mind putting into your body. Um, you know, so that's that's really exciting. And then there's always just. You know, I think the last decade we really think about as the millennial, as the archetype, and the millennial was digitally connected for the first time in, in earnest. Everything that we did was on our phones. As a result, we were socializing on our phones, which meant social networks came to, to be. Um, and then there was a new path to purchase. And with that came all the DTC brands, all the you know on-demand players, all of the different things that we now interact with on our phones. Uh, but going forward in the next 10 years, are there other platforms that are going to step change that behavior? Um, are the Gen Zs, are you and your friends going somewhere else? Um, I think a lot of people are actually doing a lot of, spending a lot of money on digital goods, on games. Games are not new, but it might be that the mindset of the new generation is actually um, evolving to a place where they would rather spend on digital goods than physical goods. Um, and so those are all things that we're tapping into and kind of doing a bunch of research on. But I think, you know, as a, as a halo of just understanding, like, where are consumers' needs, where are their behaviors going, and as a result, what are the problems that we can solve together with really ambitious founders? I love that. Really interesting companies within the portfolio. Um, when I'm back home, I'm going to need to try Eclipse. No, get some, for sure. <laughs> Sounds amazing. I think my uh, mom and sister would love that. So um, yeah, no, I'll really make sure to give that a shot. Um, so Yuri, we're going to transition into um, our next segment shortly, our five minute favorite section. Sh section. Uh, before we do, I have one last question. Um, I want to talk about board seats a little bit. Um, cool. I'm familiar that you sit on the boards of um, you know companies within your portfolio, Aura, The Farmer's Dog, um, Eclipse, of course, <laughs> I'm on yeah. your favorite company. Um, <laughs> and it, it's clear, I mean, just like from this whole uh, discussion, the value that you're um, bringing the companies, uh, you know, by sitting on a board uh, for them. I mean, just, you know, with your own personal experience and like really helping them understand what they need to do to grow, et cetera. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to, um, you know, the first question I have for you is, you know, advice for VCs 
um, you know, when it comes to pursuing boards and like getting, digging a little deeper into why they should. Um, and I'll let you know the second question um, before I let you go. Um, we've been following a trend at inside.com that a few of our analysts have written about uh, recently that some VCs have passed on board seats to get into some hot crypto deals. I'm curious if that's something that like you've also been following um, and where, how you think the industry um, as a whole is going to sh- um, you know, evolve from that news. Very interesting. Okay. So my perspective on boards, um, I remember, I think that's, it, it's a bit of a thing when you're earlier in your career in venture, you really, really want a board seat. And some of that is because you want to prove that you can do deals and you can be on a board and you can be in that decision-making room, table, screen, sure. whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, then you get a couple of boards and you're like, okay, this is real. Shit's getting real. And um, then you realize it's pretty hard. You know, it's um, it's hard to be a great board member if you haven't seen enough. And so what's really important there is do you have a team you can come back to and say, hey, I was on, uh, you know, on my board call and they asked a question about this. Like, does anyone else have experience in this? You know, how do you think about um, somebody called and wants to acquire the company? What do we do? Hmm. Or we just close the Series A. Like, we don't want to sell right now. It's like, okay, but what do I say? How do I do this? Or, oh, a strategic wants to invest. What do I say? Like, oh, well, is that helpful? Is that hurtful? I mean, there's a lot of sort of strife that goes into, you know, do we let that strategic in or is it going to, you know, limit our, our um, options going forward? Um, then there's the the main job of a board member, which is to support team building and strategy. And, you know, so you really are the thought partner with your founder and your executive team. And again, going back to, can you put yourself in a position where you can give the right advice? You're not just kind of like whipping it out, <laughs> but through anecdotes, through storytelling that you've heard from your partners or your other team members at your firm, or through your own experiences, if you've been a founder and you know, you've had these experiences before, that's what makes a great board member. When you don't have those things, you end up feeling really stressed because you're like, I don't know how to answer these questions and I need to. That's your job. You have a fiduciary responsibility, a legal responsibility to do what's in the best interest of the company. And so, you know, as you start to develop your um, career as an investor, it's great to be a board observer, hopefully with a couple of senior investors on the board that you can learn from and just be, quote, fly on the wall and um, take notes and just be there and then be able to help the founder on other things. Like the board member asks for this. Do you need help with that? Like, I can build that model or I can help you with that deck. And there, I did that too, right? I built those models and I did all of that stuff that I knew how to do and I knew would be helpful. It wasn't like the most strategic advice, but it actually like got stuff done for the founder. And so the founder was like, thank you. But then I built my reputation and my relationship with the founders over time to the point where then I had enough of my own experiences to be able to give proper sort of senior level advice. I sit on 11 boards right now. It's probably too much. Um, and... You know, and then when you get to the latter part of your career, you start to say, you want a board seat? You can take mine, <laughs> you know, and you offer those opportunities to be able to give to your team members to, to be on a board, but have backup. So I would mm-hmm. be on all of those meetings. You essentially, as a founder, get two people on your board um, to be able to support you. And that's not, that tends to be a great way to share some le- lessons and, and learnings as well. On the crypto side, it's so interesting because being on a board, board is about governance, a board is about how do you have um, a group of people who have votes and who can direct strategy and major decision making. And most importantly, a, the, the board's job is to hire and compensate the CEO. Yep. So if your founder is no longer doing a good job, like your job is actually to change that person out um, and make sure that the leadership of your company, your, your allegiance is to the company. And to all the shareholders, it is not to your class of shares as an investor, and it's not to the founder. Mm-hmm. So it's a really important thing to understand the job of a board member and a board as a whole. And so when you think about then crypto or just generally Web3 sort of decentralized entities, that's not what they want. They don't want a centralized governance entity as a board. And so I can imagine that not taking a board seat, not not instituting a board is important to the founders of decentralized um, projects and platforms. I don't know how that'll go, because as we all know, not everybody, even though like governance is decentralized, people don't vote. And so it still gets centralized in some way. Mm -hmm. And so do you end up with a better?
situation with whoever's kind of ending up in charge in a decentralized sort of situation? Or would you have been a better, uh, be better off with just a formal board? And I think that conversation is, has yet to be had and we'll see how it turns out. But, you know, when founders want advice and want to be collaborative with other advisors around the table, we find that those are the founders that do the best. Um, people who are like, oh, I don't want to hear about it. You know, I think I heard your interview with Alda. It's like people who haven't failed are kind of like not nice people. They, just, they don't understand like the, the ebbs and flows of those experiences. Well, people who don't like to listen to advice and ask around, ask around to get more feedback and information um, might be not as self-aware as you would want in your leader. So I think it, you know, it depends as all things, but um, I do think that the the role of a board member is one not to take lightly, and uh, it, it's a you know deep amount of responsibility that over time only escalates. Love your perspective, Yuri. That was amazing. Thank you so much, and really interesting uh, statement that you gave there. I mean, we're gonna have to wait and see. I mean, it's still like so early, so um, I, I totally agree. It's a trend that you know we'll all just be watching closely, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but I do like totally, um, you know, get, get the points that you made. It made a lot of sense. Um, so, all right, we're going to go into our five minute favorite section. Uh, it's going to be probably the, the speed round. We don't want to take up a time over the hour, um, because we respect that you're busy and have a lot. I know there's some, I'm like, I'm not going to be able to answer. All yeah. This. Yeah. So we'll, we'll yeah, I'll like pass if I can't come up with that. That's fine. We'll give you three passes and we'll go with the extra fun ones. Um, we'll start with number one. What's your favorite book? Okay, so I actually do have a favorite book. It's called Man's Search for Meaning okay. um, by Viktor Frankl. It's a really old book. It's, um, I think, in the 1940s. But Viktor Frankl was a prisoner at a Nazi, Nazi concentration camp. Um, hmm. He's also a um, psychotherapist. And he coined this whole new um, way of thinking about psychology uh, called logotherapy, which was about the search for purpose. And huh. it was obviously the most indescribable experience to be in a, a concentration camp. But what got him through it was to know that he had purpose and to know what that purpose was. And for him, it was his wife and it was his profession of being a psychiatrist. Um, but those who had purpose had something to live for and um, really had a different attitude towards life. And those who didn't basically didn't survive. Um, so, you know, when my mom passed away, actually, uh, last year, I read this book and it, it just meant a lot to me, um, thinking about all the ups and downs you have in life and, mm -hmm. um, how to, how to always have purpose to guide you. And a founder, I think it's really important because if you don't have real purpose, you won't make it, you know, it's just too hard to be a founder, um, otherwise. Yeah. And I, I like your point as well, where like, you know, purpose isn't, it can be, but I mean, to impact the lives of millions with my company, but I mean, it could also be, you know, like just that one individual, you know, like what, what you're really waking up every morning for, or like, you know, to support, et cetera. I think purpose can mean a few things to different people and uh, you don't have to just have one purpose as well. I think we can say, um, favorite company, this can be a company within your portfolio. Um, it can be Eclipse. It can be, uh, maybe a different company you're watching, uh, or what's a company I that mean, I you know winning? better than that. I can't pick a favorite because that's like picking your <laughs> favorite children. I, yeah, that is true. <laughs> I will have to pass on that one. My favorite company, Forerunner. Okay, love that. That's, that's a very acceptable answer. Uh, we'll go to the next one. Let's say you're walking into a very important meeting. What's that one song that you're listening to that always puts you in a great mood, motivates you? Favorite song? have a favorite song i mean this was always such a this is always such a hard thing because you think about your favorites and there's always different moods and different mm -hmm. uh, levels i think you had also thought about like um uh you know it's either music or art i actually do have a favorite artist oh, right now sure. um i can share that so her name is hilma off clint okay and uh she's a swedish artist who was you know born back in the late 1800s but she did abstract paintings and she was actually the first to do abstract paintings that ne right now, like people who like art will think of like Mondrian or Kandinsky or other male artists. Um, but Hilma was the home girl who like started mm -hmm. it all. And now her stuff is, is much more uh, public. Um, it was all kept private until the eighties. And so I think there's a big um, exhibition at Guggenheim and sort of her name has been much more prevalent uh, in the, in the market, but 
I think I'm all about female empowerment. So yep, gotta course, throw yeah. some love out to to a really amazing female artist. Of course, because of you, we might have to add that question to the list. Favorite artist. I know, right? You. Not everybody um, has a favorite artist, but you did give me an option. I was like, oh, actually, I love that. Something different. <laughs> So we'll do one more to close us off. Um, favorite piece of advice. This can be a piece of advice that you have gotten from someone else in the past or a piece of advice that you like to give to others. Um, it could be one of each, but what is your favorite piece of advice? My, my lovely late father, Papa Kim, um, always said, be ready. And I never understood what that meant. It was like a fortune cookie. It's super annoying. Um, but now being older in my career, uh, I can say that's absolutely true. You never know what's going to happen. You never know who you meet. You never know what coffee chat is going to lead to what job, which is mm -hmm. going to lead to what amazing opportunity for you. And so just be open-minded. I mean, this is venture. This is startup land, right? So everything is possible. And everything is a is a opportunity for you to turn something into um, just a, a really great experience. And so it goes back to Viktor Frankl, which is have purpose, have meaning, but also don't be so focused on the future that you're not ready for what's happening right now. I love that. You know, luck is a huge component of success, but being ready to go when you do get lucky, um, if you're not ready, I mean, my dad says that too often. If you're not ready, I mean, then you're just not going to get lucky. You're not going to find success. So 100%. got to be ready. Yuri, this was a pleasure. I want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us. I... Yeah generally like really loved every single thing that you said. I mean, this was an amazing conversation. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I will be listening to this multiple more times Thursday morning. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Landon. 